Can't get enough of Kelly and Rumya? We're now on YouTube for you to indulge in highlights from our show. Now, you access restricted lines when it comes to this, which laid the groundwork for, guess what, modern hacking. In the early days of phone freaking, tech enthusiasts, yeah, I know some of you would say thieves, including some of us with disabilities, used their unique skills to manipulate phone networks, paving the way for modern hacking. Joining us now to explain a little bit more is Mark Phoenix. Mark, what were some of these common tools used for electronic communications for the advent of a modern technologies? Well, uh, you know, we live in an age of wondrous, magical smartphone technology. So many of us go around with a, basically a magic slab with a radio and a computer built in and wave it around. Mm -hmm. You know, the AMI audience, we're fairly, you know, we're pretty familiar with what we can do with these tools to experience the world around us. But not that long ago, on the order of just a, even a couple of decades in many places, Electronic communications accessible to the to the masses were limited to the wired telephone network. We're talking copper wire, landlines permanently attached to walls, pay phones. I don't know if you know any people of a certain age, my age, might remember you know, <clears throat> being able to see these stand-up phone booths on every corner. And if you were a fan of the show Doctor Who, you were quite familiar with the British style of telephone booth. Um, and the phone. That's when they had phone numbers, for, right? You could actually call them, right? right? Back in the absolutely, day? Absolutely. Absolutely. The, 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 the uh, drug dealers and loved sometimes it. Sometimes you did. Well, you know, and the, the phone company, and there was one phone company at the time, would charge for every call, would track every call. You had to get their permission to even attach an answering machine to the phone network. It was their wow. system. Now, most people went about their lives using the phone as a tool, paying their bills, not really questioning how it operated. You know, it worked. They made their calls. That was their life. But for some people, the phone network was a new frontier, a new world to be explored. Ah, huh. what a cliffhanger. Okay, so who were the early explorers of these phone networks? And they became known by a name. What was that? Yes, they did. Well, in the late 50s, early 60s, you know, 1960s, early 1970s, some people who like to, you know, explore technology figured out how to explore the mysteries of the phone network. Now, there were unlisted test numbers, there were unofficial party lines, things that, you know, if you were a phone company employee, you might be aware of them. But if you were an outsider, this was supposed to be off limits, part of the magic of how things happen. Uh, but some people figured out how to do this. And not only that, but how to get the information out of phone company employees in the first place without realizing what they were disclosing. These people came to be known as phone freaks, and they were the forerunners of today's computer hackers. Some of the people who engaged in phone freaking, Joe Ingressia Jr., Denny Teresi, Bill Acker, and many others, were blind. Mm. Wow, that's, quite, that's, that's just amazing when you think about it. Okay, so how did Joseph Ingressia uh, Jr., other, no, otherwise known as Joy Bubbles contributes to the phone <laughs> freaking community, and what unique skill did he possess, Alan? Uh, jo Joseph Angresia Jr. Uh, he was born in Richmond, Virginia in uh, 1949, and by five, he was already playing with phones in ways that no one would expect. He figured out that rapidly tapping the phone hook would produce the pulses used in dialing at the time, so he could dial a number just by tapping the phone hook. Tapping. And yeah. Grecia wow. had perfect pitch. And by the time he was seven, he discovered that whistling at a certain frequency, mm -hmm. 2600 hertz, would trigger phone switches. Uh, <laughs> he later became known as Whistler while attending university in Florida for his ability to trigger long distance calls and he'd sell his skills for a dollar per call. Uh, and Crescia <laughs> was among the freakers arrested during a crackdown by the phone company. Again, there was one phone company at the time. They were all powerful and the FBI in the early 1970s. And he was one of the freakers featured in an Esquire article about the field published in 1971. Now you mentioned uh, his other name, Joy Bubbles, which he legally changed his name to in 1990, 1991. No, he really, he, he absolutely did this. And he did this as part of an effort to kind of reclaim his childhood. He suffered extensive abuse as a child and he wanted to re-experience that joy and wonder. So he changed his name to Joy Bubbles. 
Uh, After his freaking years, he was an active amateur radio operator. He worked with children, reading stories at the library, and he also worked with adults who also wanted to re-experience the joy and wonder of childhood. Uh, And Grecia left this world in 2007, but, you know, his uh, legacy lives on in uh, not just the world of freaking, but in movies. The character of Whistler from the 1992 film Sneakers was partly based on Engresia. Wow, okay. that's wild. I mean, it's amazing when you talk about the tone, being able to whistle to do that. I mean, a, a friend of mine I spoke to actually a, a while ago that I knew years ago really through school, this guy could hear touch tones and tell you what they were. So if you dialed a number, he would say, oh, who's that? And could dictate the number back to you if he could pick up your tone, why, if he right. would stand in near you or whatever. And he knew those and said, and just like that. I mean, instinctively, oh, whose number is yeah. that quickly he could do it. Unbelievable. And I thought that's where we were going with this example, but not even. This is like a next level up. He was mm-hmm. whistling oh, at Oh, for sure. Yes, we're, get, we're absolutely <laughs> yeah. getting to, yes, the next level of uh, phone freaking. old technology. No mm-hmm. kidding. Mm-hmm. And oh, you my can, And you can't. And you kind of allude to why, you know, a lot of the early phone freakers were blind, because so much of what happened in that early phone network was audible, audible tones, mm-hmm. yep. audible noises, hearing switches Clicks. click in. The perfect mm-hmm. environment for, pe- you know, people like us who often live in sound and yep, live focusing yep. on sound. And uh, the next person I'm going to talk about, Denny Teresi, uh, would help bring that to the next level. He was born in 1954. By 15, he was already operating a pirate radio station in Southern California. There's that, you know, free things, doing things you're not supposed to do. Now you're, you know, getting on the nerves of the FCC. And he used that to communicate with other proto-hackers via unlicensed radio signals and free long-distance calls. Now, Teresi's specialty was social engineering, which is, you know, getting information out of people, convincing people that you are, you know, who you claim to be and not who you really are, such as phone company employees, getting them to give up yep. information about, you know, the network, what was happening, how to do certain things with it. And these efforts helped the early freakers figure out how to navigate the phone network. Now, Teresi's legacy uh, it involved reaching out to another big name in phone freaking who wasn't blind, but he did have ASD. Uh, he reached out to a fellow radio pirate named John Draper who had some electrical engineering experience, and he sought his assistance in building a device that could generate the various tones used to control phone company equipment. Draper agreed, and he built the first device that came to be known as a blue box, and they became fairly popular among the underground for doing things like, you know, getting free phone calls. In fact, the founders of Apple Computer for a time made some of their early money in college building blue boxes. Uh, they became close friends. Draper would often pick up Teresi to find a payphone from which to engage in their freaking activities. Because <laughs> if you did it from home, you know, you might get the law coming yes. to your right. store, which did in fact happen. Actually, Draper told a story in the 2001 documentary, The Secret History of Hacking, about the first time he met Teresi and some of the other uh, blind phone freaks. You know, he talked to them on the phone. You know, Teresi gives him the address. Draper goes to the door, bangs on the door you know, Denny's dad answers and invites him in It brings him into this pitch dark room. And Draper asks, could you turn a light on? Uh, it's really dark in here. And, you know, his dad says, well, we don't really have the light on here because these guys are all, you know, they're completely mm-hmm. blind. Um, Draper himself actually became one of the more well-known phone freaks, uh, partly because of inventing the blue box, the blue box. He took up the name Captain Crunch in honor of a toy whistle that was carried in boxes of the cereal, which just happened to generate that critical 2,600 hertz tone. Uh, (laughs) Absolutely. Um, And those those whistles are now fairly sought after collector's items. Uh, Mm. Teresi himself became known as Dennis Terry. He got into radio, and he continues to host a radio program on KSJS 90.5 FM in San Jose, California, to this very day. Wow, that's amazing! Wow, this is I, I, so I'm trying to think impressive. which. I'm trying to think what TV show, maybe it was the Rockford Files or something like that that I saw. The because they would, they'd give private detectives. These were the early little sneaky tools that PIs would have in early like like 1970s, early 80s TV. Uh, what about Bill Acker's experience as a phone hacker? Uh, influence his. Um, his his career and what ex, what contribution did he make to those voice accessibility tools? 
Well, Bill Acker, growing up in New York, had always wanted to work for the phone company. And like many other, you know, young blind uh, kids across the U.S. and Canada, he uh, became a you know, a font of familiarity and knowledge with the phone network. In fact, uh, an actual phone company central office in Queens, New York, posted a note for new employees that if they had questions to reach out to the then still teenage Bill, and they posted his phone number so they could call him if they had questions about how <laughs> their network operated. Yeah. Um, like I said, he dreamed of working for a phone company, and indeed, he would end up spending 27 years working for Mountain Bell. That's one of the companies that uh, uh, the single phone company, AT&T, Ma Bell, whatever you want to call it, was broken up into in the early 1980s. He actually hitchhiked out to California in 1973 with his girlfriend at the time. And uh, he, uh, I now I'm not entirely sure if this is the same woman he married, but he was married to his wife for 29 years. Um, mm. He had, he built quite a life out there. Now, he credited his years as a phone freaker with making him a better troubleshooter for the phone network. Now, yeah. he kept up with the march to digital. He got into computer networking, voiceover, internet protocol, and he maintained the Speak Up voice accessibility tool for certain distributions of the Linux operating system. So he kept mm -hmm. up with the times as well as he could. Acker died in 2015, and his memorial service took place both in person and over phones. Fittingly. <laughs> that wow. is amazing. Yeah, I remember hearing his name through a lot of the, the Linux people that I know who all used it, and it was really big. And just uh, it, because there was not that many people that were really using Linux. So awesome, Mark. That is really cool. Some very fascinating stuff that takes you history. back and makes you say, wow. Uh, great, great subject to bring up. Thanks for doing this. Hey, no problem. We are everywhere, whether you know it or yeah, not. For sure. But hopefully, yeah, now my you know goodness. A bit more. Wow. Talk about the talkative talkers out there and getting a job based on your own. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like hiring the guy who can break into safes and say, listen, man, uh, we design well, safes. Just tell us what not to do. Right, Mark? Ethical well, hacking as a matter such. Oh, I was just going to say, as a matter of fact, that remains a common thing to this day. A lot of yeah. hackers who, you know, may have gotten in trouble at one point end up getting hired as security consultants. In fact, one of the mm -hmm. most uh, infamous hackers of the early of the late 90s and early 2000s, Kevin Mitnick, uh, mm -hmm. went down that very route in life. He did his, you know, four years in the can for uh, hacking into... I believe it might have been AT&T itself. I need to review that. <laughs> and uh, now he's a consultant. And that's true for many other hackers. Yeah. Once you get inside a system, once you know the ins and outs of it, um, it becomes very valuable to, you know, keep you employed and close and, you know, keeping up on the system while, you know, keep yep. trying to stay on the right side of the law, as it were. Quite a form of rehab. Quite yes, rehab. absolutely. Or working both sides of the, f of the fence, right? <laughs> yeah. Well. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for watching. You can catch Kelly and Rumya weekdays from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern on AMI.